All right, we'll, we'll be turning later in this message to uh, Genesis chapter 19. Pretty soon we'll get there. You may want to have that scripture at the ready. I'm going to open this message by stating that the title of the message today is 1946, The Stupidest Movie Ever. That's the title of the message today. And before I continue, I want to make note that that word stupidest that is not only according to Merriam-Webster, an entirely acceptable word grammatically, but it's uh, also the best word I can think of to describe a critically acclaimed documentary movie that's set to premiere or debut tomorrow night, Monday, January 9th, in the theater near you, titled 1946, The Mistranslation That Shifted Culture. You guys heard of this? This is news to you guys? You've heard of it? Okay. No, no. News. That's news. All right, well, actually the movie uh, opens tomorrow in the Camelot chain of theaters, and then this Friday the 13th in the Regal Cinema Chain, the uh, sure-to-be-block-busting, box-office-smashing premise of the movie, 1946, the mistranslation, the shift of culture, is that the word homosexual, they say, the word homosexual never appeared in any Bible translation until the Revised Standard Version was published in 1946. And therefore, they say, the translators of the RSV wrongly inserted the word homosexuals into the New Testament back in 1946, at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 1 Timothy 1, 10. And thus the Bible, they say, does not truly say that homosexuality is a sin. That, by the, that is the entire premise, plot, and purpose for which this movie was produced. That's it. That the word homosexual never appeared in any Bible translation until 1946, and thus the Bible does not truly say that homosexuality is a sin, they're trying to say. I have somewhat to say about this. The official trailer for this movie opens with a video of John MacArthur, actually. Uh, quoting a portion of 1 Corinthians 6-9 from what appears to be, I think, a 1995 version of the New American Standard Bible, where MacArthur says this, Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then the movie goes on to tell the tale of a team of queers who purportedly discover that the term homosexuals was well, never supposed to be in the Bible in the first place in their research. And although this may well be, I believe, the stupidest movie ever, as I'll attempt to show in this message, the film is in fact intended as a direct attack upon the real Bible itself, mm-hmm. which, by the way, does not include the RSV or the NIV or the New American Standard Version or any other modern translation. And it's also a direct attack upon all those like us who actually take the Bible seriously, and hold it up as the authority for our life. And to prove that point, here's a brief summary of the message from the homepage of its promotional website. 1946, The Mistranslation of Shift to Culture, is a feature documentary that follows the story of tireless researchers who trace the origins of the anti-gay movement among Christians to a grave mistranslation of the Bible in 1946. As if that's when Christians became anti-gay, right? 1946. It chronicles the discovery of never-before-seen archives at Yale University, that bastion of theological truth, right? which unveil astonishing new revelations and cast significant doubt on any biblical basis for LGBTQ prejudice. Featuring commentary from prominent scholars, as well as opposing pastors, including the personal stories of the film's creators, 1946 is at once challenging, enlightening, and inspiring. Right? And so in that statement, they're trying to say, of course, the Bible does not actually condemn homosexuality. But then they contradict themselves by the next statement in their summary on their website, the homepage says, while other documentaries have been successful in their attempt to treat the symptom of homophobia in the church, 1946 is working to diagnose and treat the disease, which is biblical literalism. Can you catch that? I'll repeat that. Well, other documentaries have been successful in their attempt to treat the symptom of homophobia in the church. That's just a symptom. They say 1946 is working to diagnose and treat the disease, which is biblical literalism. The disease in our society today is people that believe the Bible literally. 
That's the disease. So we're, we're the diseased ones. They're normal. That's this new movie. You see why I'm titling this message the stupidest movie ever? Does it make sense now? So by that last statement, actually, the creators of this film are trying to convey and impose upon society the view that the Bible cannot be taken literally. The homosexuality, which was just a few decades ago deemed to be a mental illness, is not an illness at all. In fact, it's quite natural, they'd have us believe. But it is instead biblical Christianity. Those who believe the Bible and hold it to be authoritative, who have the disease. Another favorable and therefore nonsensical view of the movie gives this synopsis of the plot. Just so you know, uh, you don't need to go see the movie. I'll give it to you briefly. Uh, Here's the review. At what moment in history did the Catholic Church transform Scripture into a sacred weapon to be used against LGBTQ people? That immediately tells you that they deem the Catholic Church to be the bastion of Christianity. Director Sharon Rocky Roggio, she's the director of this movie, explores the history of homophobia in the church with 1946 and mistranslation has shifted a culture. Roggio uses herself as a starting point to interrogate the complex relationship between queerness and faith. The daughter of a pastor, Roggio tells how she realized she was a lesbian at 16 which prompted her father to cite a handful of Bible verses advising her to escape damnation. Raggio shares how this act of preaching intolerance rather than love prompted her to walk away from her family. However, many of her lessons her father taught her fuel her, her curiosity. How or why uh, love can be so selective in the Catholic Church becomes a question she must answer. Raggio connects with fellow inquisitors, notably Kathy Baldock and Ed Oxford, who pinpoint the moment that everything changed. They looked to a 1946 translation that introduced the word homosexual to the Bible. That's where it all changed, 1946. Digging and digging, they checked Bibles of all languages and editions dating back to rare finds published centuries ago. The film smartly unpacks the meticulousness with which words are chosen when the text is so sacred and widely published. Obviously, since it's set to open tomorrow night, I have not seen the movie yet. I don't plan to, actually. Amen. Uh, but I have studied enough of the film's website, promotional videos, and reviews for the film, including its official trailer, as published to YouTube. Based on that study, I believe I can truthfully say today that I know enough about this movie to, to comment on it today in a review of my own. And even before this movie is released to the public tomorrow, I can say without question and unequivocally that this movie is a remarkably excellent An outstanding example of the kind of mental confusion and degradation that characterizes the mind of the man or woman who goes about to justify behavior that he knows in his heart or that he should know, he knew at one time, is sin and immorality. I would say that the fact that this movie, based on this premise, ever went into production, serves, I believe, as a public proof what the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, that those who give themselves over to such sins, homosexuality and others, have been given over by God to what the Bible calls a reprobate mind. In other words, to a mental illness. From the beginning of time, mankind has sought to find ways to excuse and to justify his sin and and in his rebellion against God rather than acknowledging it as sin, seeking the cleansing and redemption from his sin that God offers to them freely. That typical human trait actually began with the fall of Adam and Eve. The progenitors of the human race, when they fell into sin, Eve blamed the serpent for her sin, remember, saying, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. But then Adam, in effect, blamed both Eve and God himself for his sin, saying, the woman whom thou gavest me, to be with me. She gave me of the tree and I did eat. It's that woman, that evil woman you gave me. It's your fault, God, for giving me this such an evil woman. And so just like Adam and Eve's failed attempt to hide from God in the bushes and cover their nakedness with fig leaves, from its very inception, the entire premise of this film is so ignorant, so incorrect, and so irrational for so many reasons that it blows my mind that such 
an absurd and ridiculous concept would be taken into production and made into a feature film of the quality required to be released in the aforementioned theaters. It just blows my mind. But this is where our society has come to today. Blows my mind. For starters, one immediate blunder, uh, the RSV was not published in 1946. <laughs> it was actually published in 1951, although, of course, it was in the works for a few years before that. I would say that the RSV, like all other modern perversions of the scriptures that are translated from the corrupted uh, Westcott and Hort Greek text from the New Testament, is not a true Bible. Right. Not a Bible. I have no time to cover that topic today, but for those who want more inf information on that subject, I would encourage you, invite you to study the King James Bible page on our website and understand why we in this church use the King James Bible exclusively. Amen. Then also another fallacy of this film is that it portrays the Catholic Church as being the authority, as being representative of true Christianity, which it is not, That's by right. the way. I have no time to cover that topic today either, but again, those who want more information on that subject are invited to study our webpage titled Lies of the Catholic Church to understand that there is no salvation in the rites, rituals, and sacraments of the Catholic Church. Amen. Aside from these immediate blunders, there are multiple reasons that the very premise that this new movie is based upon is downright senseless and irrational. First of all, and aside from what the Bible says, which we'll get to in a moment, the very notion that the production and publication of the RSV Bible or any other modern translation of the Bible in any way shifted or transformed modern culture to make it less approving or more condemning of homosexual behavior than it used to be is itself based in gross ignorance of the facts and the history of Western civilization, even in modern times, is the most horrible form of historical revisionism pushed to hysterical extremes that I can think of. I have to say that our modern culture in general is today far more accepting of the homosexual lifestyle than it was just a few decades ago. And if open opposition to the LGBT queer agenda has grown in recent decades, it's only in reasonable expected reaction to the growing insistence of the queers to loudly promote their agenda publicly and to do so in the openly vile and disgusting manner they insist upon exhibiting in their so-called gay pride parades mm -hmm. and events. I grew up in Iowa in the 1960s. I graduated from high school in 1977. And I remember quite clearly when queers began coming out of the closet, as they say, as they used to say, which is at about the same time that the uh, AIDS and HIV began manifesting in our culture after the famous He-Man and movie star Rock Hudson announced in 1985 that he'd been diagnosed with AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, thereby also publicly announcing that he was queer. And that was the first most of us ever even heard of that disease, AIDS. According to Wikipedia, the first news story on the disease, AIDS, appeared on May 18, 1981. When the gay newspaper in New York Native, you remember that, Mary, when, this, when it came out? No, okay. AIDS was first clinically reported in, on June 5, 1981, with five cases in the, in the United States. Initial cases were a cluster of injecting drug users and gay men with no known cause of impaired immunity who showed symptoms of a pneumocystis pneumonia, a rare opportunistic infection that was known to occur in people with very com compromised immune systems. Soon thereafter, a large number of homosexual men began. Uh, developed a generally rare skin cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma, et cetera, et cetera, it goes on. But it, it, that's when this, this disease emerged. It was in the 1980s or 1981. Prior to that time, the homosexual lifestyle was so frowned upon and rejected by society that queers generally kept their lifestyle in the closet. Mm -hmm. uh, but back then, there would be no way for the U.S. Supreme Court to rule that same-sex marriage is to be a federally protected right. No way. Or for an openly transsexual, self-mutilated man who thinks he's a woman, Dr. Richard Rachel Levine, to be appointed by Uncle Joe Biden to the high office of Assistant Secretary of the Federal Department of Health. No way that would have been even contemplated. 
or for an openly queer man like Pete Buttigieg, or Booty Gig, however the current Secretary of Transportation wants his name to be pronounced. No way for a man like that to run for president in 1980 as he did in 2020. Wouldn't have been even thought of. Or for Uncle Joe Biden to appoint him as Secretary of Transportation. These things were unthinkable four decades ago. But now, poor Mayor Pete is crying foul because he's under public scrutiny, not for being queer, per se, but for taking his husband with him on business trips. The point here is that the premise this film is based upon that the production and publication of the RSV Bible or any other modern translation of the Bible in any way shifted or transformed modern culture to make it less accepting or more condemning of homosexual behavior than it used to be is itself based in gross ignorance of the well-documented history of Western civilization for the past 2,000 years which for those many centuries has professed, at least, to be a Christian culture, and has therefore for centuries been generally condemning of homosexuality as a damnable sin. Which is why, until recently, every state in the Union had anti-sodomy laws banning homosexual practice. Which such laws, by the way, still exist on the books in 16 states. Which is why queers stayed in the closet 40 years ago, and kept their sexual preference secret until just the last few decades. The very notion of gay or homosexual rights is a very recent development. Not that long ago, the word gay actually meant cheerful and happy. Who, who remembers the Flintstones cartoon TV show? Anybody? Right, Flintstones, amen, all right. It was not that long ago uh, when the lyrics to that theme song for the popular TV cartoon show, The Flintstones, with Fred and Wilma and... And uh, Barney and Betty Rubble, Pebbles and Bam Bam, closed with the line, when you're with the Flintstones, we'll have a gay old time. Yeah. Remember that? I can sing it for you. You want to sing it for you? No. When you're with the Flintstones. Oh, okay. I want to do that. But after the queer movement perverted the very word gay, which once meant cheerful and happy. By the way, have you ever met a happy queer? No. No. Yes. They're all miserable. Have you really? Yeah, I know. Oh, you do? Happy. Really happy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you're the exception of the rule. Because <laughs> <laughs> everyone I've ever met has been miserable. All right. Well, anyway, your friends are your, your friends are an exception to the rule. But the queers, of course, they perverted that word gay, as they also did with God's rainbow, and they're now trying to do with the Bible. Mm-hmm. The producers of Flintstones had to dub in a new theme song, as I recall. <coughs> it was not that long ago that not only did that word gay mean happy, and would have not even been thought of in connection with homosexuality. But also, it was not that long ago that homosexuality and transgenderism was deemed by the professional medical community to be a diagnosable mental illness. Mm-hmm. Not that long ago. As mentioned last March, almost a year ago, in a message titled The Insanity of Transgenderism, the entire pro-queer movement today is all about society's attempt to normalize insanity. It's still true, according to the latest authoritative secular reference guide used for diagnosing mental illness, titled the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, known commonly as DSM-5, a person who believes that he or she is actually or should be female when his biological sex at birth was male or vice versa should be diagnosed as having a mental illness classified as gender identity disorder, also known as gender dysphoria. That's still in the books. It's a disease. And until a few days ago, as of January 1st, 2022, the World Health Organization's International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems also classified transgenderism as a mental disorder. Now we've got this transgender that Joe Biden appointed as an assistant secretary of the Department of Health. This is where society has come. The fact that homosexuality and transgenderism must be deemed to be against nature, contrary to nature, abnormal, and in fact nothing less than suicidal and destructive to mankind's very existence is proven by the obvious fact of nature. But if the entire human race was queer, the entire human race would be extinct within one generation. It's destructive. It's abnormal. 
And in that sense alone, this is the stupidest movie ever. Well, I do not expect this movie to have much success at the box office. I'm sure it will be well attended by at least the small but all too vocal minority, the population that makes up the LGBT queer community, who, by the way, have an all too disproportionate voice in Washington, D.C. and the controlled media. Again, the point here is that, first point, is that the very premise of this new movie is based upon is downright senseless and irrational. Right. It's just a public display of the fact that, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1, they've been given over to a reprobate mind. The first reason being the very notion that the production and publication of the RSV Bible or any other modern translation of the Bible in any way shifted or transformed modern culture is itself based on gross ignorance and the facts of history. Secondly, the very notion that the Bible has to actually use the word homosexual in order to condemn homosexual behavior is also an obvious error based in blatant ignorance, as is also the notion that there is any possible way for an honest, sane person of average intelligence to in any way whitewash homosexuality from the Bible to make it appear as acceptable Christian behavior. That's also completely absurd. The very notion, whitewashing homosexuality as acceptable Christian behavior to anyone who has read the Bible is completely absurd. We, of course, reject the RSV and all other modern translations in this church. We seek the authorized King James Bible, which, by the way, nowhere includes the term homosexual. Mm -hmm. It's not in there. But that still, without use of that particular word, clearly condemns homosexual behavior right. in no uncertain terms. Amen. In some ways, really in stronger terms than the modern Bible perversions do that do use the word homosexual. For the purpose of this message, I'm going to repeat some of what I covered in prior messages on the topic. And in doing so, I want to remind the producers of this movie, along with the entire LGBTQ community and world in general, that the animalistic, degrading, most unhealthy and destructive sexual perversion that takes such pride in promoting is still, to this day, 4,000 years later, known to the world as sodomy. That act, sodomy, is, of course, named after those ancient twin sister cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, that gave themselves over to sexual perversion. We read in Genesis 13, verse 13. We're chapter 19 in a minute. Genesis 13, verse 13 says that the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And then here in chapter 19, we see here what their wickedness actually was. Genesis 19, verse 1. There came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. He bowed himself with his face toward the ground and said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house. And tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. They said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. He pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed, surrounded the house, round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot, said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. Here at this verse, of course, uh, that word know means to know carnally, yep. to have sex with them. Right. We know that, by the way, with certainty, based on what follows. Verse 6, And Lot went out at the door unto them, and shut the door after him, and said, I pray you, brethren, brethren, do not so wickedly. Don't do such a wicked act to know these men. Behold, now I have two daughters which I have not known, man. In other words, they're virgins. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes, said Lot. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Obviously, the fact that Lot would offer the wicked men of this city his daughters shows how depraved he had become, how cowardly and wicked Lot was as well. But then, that said, we read that the angels pulled Lot back into the house and smote the man outside with blindness. And, we read, and then they said to Lot in verse 12, 
Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters, whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. We read then later in verse 24, after Lot, his wife and his daughters escaped the city, they were outside the city, we read verse 24, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. Down to verse 27 we read, And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Some foolishly see this as a fanciful fairy tale that should not be taken literally. However, modern archaeology has confirmed, as the Lord Jesus himself confirmed also in Matthew chapter 11, that just as the Bible declares here in chapter 19, those twin cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, were indeed wiped out by God via the raining down of fire and brimstone from heaven, confirmed by modern archaeology. During his ministry on this earth, the Lord Jesus was rejected in the city of Capernaum. Despite the many miracles of healing he had done there, And so he exclaimed in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 23, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. He said, But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. The Lord Jesus here confirms that as as a literal event, The Old Testament account of Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction from heaven, and as stated, so does modern archaeology. Just about seven years ago, an archaeologist named Stephen Collins combined clues from the Bible, Genesis chapter 13 and 19, with archaeological evidence in the site of an ancient city now called Tal al-Hamam in modern-day Jordan. And you can go online and verify this. Uh, Just do a search for Tal al-Hamam. Which which ancient city? Collins... Uh, believes uh, from the evidence he found is in fact the city of Sodom, what's, what, what's left of it. He found attractive land known in what's called the Kikar near the northeast shore of the Dead Sea. That, by the way, mysterious sea of hypersaline <coughs> salt water where no fish can live, the shores of which are found at the lowest point of land on the face of the earth, a full 1,400 feet below sea level. The lowest point on earth. As if after destroying the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, God pressed that whole area down into the earth. Pressed it down into the earth. Unlike other Canaanite cities that continued to flourish until around 1200 B.C., archaeological evidence shows that Tal al-Hamam was destroyed by fire in about 3500 B.C. And the area remained uninhabited for seven centuries. Collins and his team of associated archaeologists excavated this ancient site over a nine-year period ending in 2015. All across the site, they found widespread evidence of an intense fire or an inferno that left the city in ruins. They found scorched foundations and floors buried under nearly three feet of dark gray ash, as well as dozens of pottery sherds covered with a frothy, melted, glassy uh, surface. The glassy appearance actually indicates that they were briefly exposed to temperatures well in excess of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the approximate heat of volcanic magma. Such evidence suggests that the city and its surrounding area were catastrophically destroyed in a sudden and extreme judgment by fire. And it's from a source that is not consistent with a natural calamity such as a volcanic eruption. Not, not, not consistent with that. Which is because, just as we read in Genesis 19, After first reading of the homosexual perversion of the men of the city in Sodom, we then read in verse 24 that the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. He overthrew those cities and all the plain, and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. As a result of this judgment upon Sodom, throughout the Old Testament, the Bible continues to refer to homosexuals as sodomites. The Bible refers to them as sodomites based on what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, just as the English-speaking world today still refers to their gross sexual perversion as sodomy. Mm-hmm. 
In the law at Deuteronomy 23, verse 17, we read, There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. And in Leviticus 18, we read, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. If there's any doubt about the meaning of the term sodomite, that verse in Leviticus 18 unequivocally condemns homosexual behavior between two men as a sin worthy of death. That undeniable fact is then made clear in two chapters later in Leviticus 20, verse 13, which says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them, too, have committed an abomination. And they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So it's talking about homosexuality, all right? It's condemning as a sin punishable by death, an abomination. As Israel and Judah then later turned from God to idolatry, they too, like Sodom and Gomorrah, and just as America today has done also, became tolerant of the LGBTQ community. So that we read in 1 Kings 14, verse 24, that during the days of Solomon's son, King Rehoboam, There were also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. A few good kings of Judah did arise, and later Hezekiah and others that the Bible says removed the sodomites out of the land. Turn over to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16. Again, the point here is that it is utter folly for today's queers to attempt to in any way whitewash homosexuality from the Bible as acceptable Christian behavior. Right. Mm-hmm. Although many of these days are attempting to do so. They turn, for instance, to Ezekiel chapter 16 and attempt to say that homosexuality was not the sin of the men of Sodom that brought God's judgment, since the Bible here in this passage says their sin was their pride. However, after reading the passage in Genesis 19, we read what happened there. We know what their sin was. All right. We then see here in Ezekiel 16... There was, in fact, their gay pride, the gay pride, the same type of pride that the LGBTQ community today revels in, that caused the men of Sodom to think that they could have their way with those angelic visitors to Lot's house. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel 16, verse 48. God says, As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom, he's talking now to, to Jerusalem, all right? had been turned aside to idolatry. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and the abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. But then it says, verse 50, And they were haughty, prideful. And then they committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. Neither has Samaria, northern ten tribes, committed half of thy sins. He's talking to Judah here. But thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they, and hast justified thy sisters in all an abomination which thou hast done. So the first sin of the men of Sodom was pride. The kind of pride that the Bible says goes before destruction. The kind of pride that is, that is the very sin that led to Lucifer's rebellion. Right. The kind of pride that I believe is in God's eyes the worst sin of all because pride is the root and the cause of all other sins before God. Which is why it is the first sin that God cites as the reason for Sodom's destruction. Then we see here in verse 50 that their gay pride caused them to commit abomination. Men lying with mankind as they would with womankind as we read is forbidden in Leviticus 18 and 20. That's right. At its worst, pride is a state of mind and attitude of the heart that results in rebellion against God. It's the sin that produces this kind of stupid movie we see coming out tomorrow. Pride is a rebellious spirit of independence from God. This is the type of pride that the men of Sodom displayed and that America today displays. It's a sin that we all, all of us, need to be on guard against because with us also, it is pride that causes us to lose our fear of God, causes us to choose to sin, thinking God will not chastise us for our sin. It's pride that causes us as Christians to think that God will allow us to sin or that we have a right to sin in just this one area. God will allow me just this one sin. 
as pride that causes unbelievers to think they are good enough to merit eternal life. They don't need this Jesus. That's pride. So it is pride that keeps men from repenting of their sin and coming to the cross to be saved. We see in Ezekiel 16 that the primary sin that brought God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah was the pride that caused the men of Sodom to think they could shake their fist at God and revel in their sin and their sexual perversion. So to those in this so-called land of the free, who rejoice in their so-called sexual freedom and the heinous sin that God calls an abomination. As the Lord Jesus once said to Capernaum, he now says to this wicked nation that insists on celebrating gay pride. But I say unto you, this shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom than the day of judgment than for thee. God says to the once so-called Christian America, your pride will precede your destruction as well. Just as God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, so America's destruction will come. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Or 1 Corinthians 6. Again, the official trailer for this movie opens with a video of John MacArthur <clears throat> quoting a portion of 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 from again what appears to be the 1995 version of the New American Standard Bible. And MacArthur says, quote, Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's not quite the way that verse reads in the real Bible, the King James Bible. We read here in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. In MacArthur's 1995 NASB, the word homosexuals is translated from the original Greek word arseniketai. Arseniketai is the word in Greek. Here in the King James Bible, the King James translators translated that word abusers of themselves with mankind based, I guess, upon the language of Leviticus 20, that if a man shall lie with mankind as he lie with, with, lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. This word, arseniketai, occurs in only one other verse in the New Testament, which is at 1 Timothy 1, verse 10. Paul says, beginning in verse 9 of 1 Timothy 1, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for, the, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, verse 10, for whoremongers, and for them that defile themselves with mankind, etc., etc., there. That phrase, them that defile themselves with mankind, is again translated from that Greek word, arseniketai. And the word clearly refers to homosexuals, a.k.a. the sodomites. I'm not under any delusion today of thinking that this message will cause any number of homosexuals to repent of their sin and turn to Christ for true salvation. At the same time, I do want to inform the LGBTQ community who have not already tuned me out, to notice what this passage in 1 Corinthians 6 is truly saying. What's it really saying here? Paul's point here is not to single out homosexuals as the worst of chief sinners. What Paul is here saying is that we were all sinners of one kind or another before we got saved. And all the sins listed here, among many others, exclude the sinner from the joys of eternal life and instead condemn him to eternal torment. That's right. But then look what Paul says in verse 11 here in 1 Corinthians 6. And such were some of you. Mm-hmm. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Paul says salvation is available to all who recognize their sin. Meaning those who agree with God that their sin is sin, and that it must be repented of, And who then, because of that recognition that their sin is sin, therefore come to Jesus by faith in his shed blood for cleansing from their sin, recognize that there is no other hope for any of us to be saved. For those who do receive that cleansing and redemption, Paul says in this passage, and the whole of the New Testament confirms, we have been washed from our sins in the blood of the Lamb. We've been washed. Amen. 
We've been sanctified. That means we have been set apart for the Master's use. Those who have repented and come to Christ for salvation, we've been sanctified. And he says we've been justified, meaning that we have been declared to be righteous based on His righteousness. The Bible says He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He has clothed us with the righteousness of Christ, declared us to be righteous. We've been justified. And we have therefore been set free from the penalty and the power of sin. We have been given a hatred of sin. We talked about it earlier. We therefore no longer continue in it. This is what Paul's driving at here. He's saying here, if you're truly saved, you don't continue in your sin. And don't think you can, because if you think you can, you're not, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's what he's saying here. Turn to Romans chapter 9. As mentioned earlier, from the beginning of time, mankind has sought to find ways to excuse and justify his sin before God, rather than acknowledging it as sin and seeking the cleansing and redemption from it that God offers. Many today try to say, well, God made me like this, so it's not my fault. That's what they try to say today. Well, God made me like this. It can't be my fault. I was born this way. How can God condemn me when He made me this way, they say. Sinners of every variety try to say that, by the way. It's not just homosexuals. Alcoholics try to say that. Claiming that scientists have now discovered that alcoholism is an inherited addiction resulting from a birth defect in the brain. One of my former clients, who was a very wealthy home builder in the Tampa area named Jack, who owns a very large home building company. He knew, knew I was a Christian from my testimony. He once asked me, if adultery is sin, then why did God make every man with such strong sexual desires? This was in the mid-90s. I told him at that time, well, that was part of God's command to be fruitful and multiply. But to him, it was an excuse to commit adultery. It's nothing new to blame God for our sin. Again, our first father Adam did that way back in Genesis chapter 3. That this woman you gave me, God, it's your fault. Here in Romans chapter 9, Paul says it's nothing new either. He says, Romans 9, verse 19, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Paul says, verse 20, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? That's right. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? The point of this passage in Romans chapter 9 is that God is sovereign and can do as he will. Amen. But the Bible also says that he is not the author of confusion and tempts no man to sin. God created man in his own image. But Adam fell into sin of his own volition. All on his own. And the day he did that, he fell from that perfect image of God and became a sinner. He ate of the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He thereby acquired a sin nature, which he passed on to the entire human race and cursed all creation thereby. As Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and death, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. We inherited that sin nature from our first father, Adam. So what Paul says in this passage in Romans 9 is that God is sovereign. He's in control. He writes the rules in his universe, and therefore a puny man needs to simply acknowledge and believe the truth of God as He has given it to us in the, in the real Bible. Amen. And then to submit to His will, which means that we must recognize that we are all sinners. We have all rebelled against God's laws. We all stand condemned guilty of sin. <clears throat> we have to believe that our sin condemns us before God, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We have to believe also that we cannot earn, we cannot merit eternal life by our own good works or by our own merit or by, not by being baptized or through the rituals or sacraments of any church. But only as Jesus said, by being born again can we be saved. And as Paul says in Titus 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified by His grace, Paul says there, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We must believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, willingly suffered, 
bled, and died on the Roman cross to pay our death penalty, to redeem us from our sin and offer us eternal life. And that after three days, Jesus was bodily resurrected from the grave to prove He was the Son of God, He was Christ, and everything He said was true. And we must then repent of our sin, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and receive Him as our Savior and our Lord to be forgiven of our sins and to receive everlasting life. Amen. As John writes in John chapter 1, the Gospel of John 1, verse 9, that Jesus was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, he gives us all enough light that if we respond to it positively, He'll give us more light and we can be saved. Verse 10, He was in the world, the world, the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came into His own, Israel, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, Amen. even to them that believe right. on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor are the will of man, but of God. That's what it means to be born of God, to receive Christ as your Savior. There's much more I could say on this topic, but that's going to do it for today. Well, let's just pray and trust that the Lord will use this message to reach and impact those hearts He does, does desire to reach. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank You for Your Word that You've made alive to us, to our hearts. We thank You, Lord, that You have given us Your Word and that it is perfect and complete and trustworthy and true. I pray that you would uh, bring to repentance those who, who need to repent of this folly, this sin, Lord, and especially the sin of corrupting your word. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you'd use us to preach the gospel to the lost as you'd have us to do. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.